Parker. Well, with that, let's get started. Katie, take it away. Sure. And I just want to say I'm noticing all the lovely plants uh, behind us today, <laughs> um, getting us excited for spring wherever you're living. Um, so let's start with, as Kathleen mentioned, a poll. Um, we're all thinking about spring, but which garden project is on your must do list this spring? Is it freshening up, you know, your borders and beds, just really wanting to add a few new plants, um, you know, maybe some, some new color, some exciting statement plant, or maybe you want to create an entire new outdoor dining area. We're really seeing that a lot of our um, followers are reaching out to us asking for ideas to create more entertaining spaces outside. Or maybe you plan to redo the front yard, maybe take out a lawn, add in some pollinator plants. Um, just wondering what brings you here today. And I can see everybody's answering the questions. We've got great participation so far. Uh, looks like freshening up borders and beds um, are what most people are focused on, which makes a lot of sense. Um, I know I, right now, I'm, I have a lot of ambitions in my mind, but, <laughs> but practically speaking, I think that's where I'm going to be focused. Um, but I know Georgia has, you know, higher goals, let's say, this year <laughs> with, with her new home. Uh, so it looks like um, we've got... 67% uh, uh, wanting to freshen up borders and beds, 8% create that outdoor dining area, and 25% redoing the front yard. Um, and that seems about typical uh, in terms of what we know most gardeners are looking for. Well, let's jump in so we can in hopefully inspire you. Uh, let me just move my, there we go. Uh, so, <laughs> Ever since we cultivated the land and could move rocks, we have been trying to transform the landscape to suit our human needs, whether that's um, in honor of spiritual beliefs we might have or creating spaces for recreation and relaxation, places to entertain. But don't worry, I'm not going to start with Stonehenge and take you all the way through landscape design history today. Um, this is just a, a way to kind of ground us in the idea that um, there are so many ideas from the, the past that are still resonating in our design ideas today. You know, some timeless principles that I want to touch on uh, that can hopefully help you achieve, um, you know, the look and feel that you want in your garden today. And I, I think it's interesting to me to notice how those historic design lessons can be carried out in, in trends today. And then Georgia is going to um, add in the plants that can help you um, achieve uh, the look that you want. So let's let's jump in. Um, and as I said, this is no, by no means an exhaustive uh, history, but I wanted to start by talking about inspiration from the Greeks and ancient Romans, which really have informed um, so much garden design, not just in Europe, but definitely in the US, and some key lessons that uh, we can take away that are still resonating today. One is symmetry. The Greeks and ancient Romans really gave us this idea as they put together their beautiful uh, gardens and landscapes of um, symmetry, proportion, balance, and the idea of viewing your uh, garden from you know, an entry point or from inside the house that you would have a, a serene feeling if you looked out on a balanced landscape. Um, also, the, the term topiaris uh, was actually the term for gardener in the Roman Empire. Um, those were the the professionals, let's say, that 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 trimmed the boxwoods and kept the cypress plants, you know, tidy, um, because the look of this garden, the style, was very ornamental um, and very, um, uh, you know, taken care of, well groomed. Um, they also gave us 
the kitchen garden, you know, the idea of having your herbs located conveniently um, near, near your kitchen um, and, uh, you know, rosemary and lavender and many of the plants that they used would be familiar to us uh, today. The examples that I have on the screen are actually, they're not from, you know, those ancient times, but they're um, reconstructions, um, you know, trying to kind of recreate uh, that look. Um, the image on the left is the, the Getty Villa in uh, Southern California. The image on the right is a recreation of a peristyle garden, but uh, it was kind of like a, a courtyard or a, a porch garden. So smaller um, uh, townhomes in, in Roman times would have these um, smaller, but still very balanced and symmetrical uh, gardens. And often a water feature would be center, sort of drawing your eye uh, in as well. So what does that mean today? Uh, well, I think one of the, the ways that we can see that repeated today is in a trend that we call architectural simplicity. That's the, the image on the left, which is a contemporary garden that still uses the idea of symmetry, topiary, evergreens to kind of round out your space, um, linear paths uh, to walk. And then the, the image on the right is an example of a trend that we call the garden of abundance, which is weaving those kitchen garden ideas, herbs, or pollinators, fruit trees into the landscape, and also doing it in kind of a symmetrical, balanced way. And we can see that you don't need to have a a large landscape actually to, to create these looks. You know, you don't need to have the, the Roman villa. This is an, actually an example of uh, a plan that is uh, going to be in our ultimate spring planning guide. Look for that next week. Um, it's designed by Lisa Nunnemaker and it's using some of these ideas of architectural simplicity, using evergreens. Um, you can see how balanced it is on both, side of, both sides of that outdoor dining space. Um, and also by relying on evergreens and grasses, it's easier to take care of and maintain, which is what you want around those, those uh, outdoor dining spaces. You know, you just want to relax there with friends. You don't want to have to worry a lot about uh, maintaining it. But it does have a little pop of color, you know, here and there, too, um, to draw the eye, add more interest. And uh, Georgia has a few other ideas of plants that we could use in that space and others. Yeah, so um, there's a lot of different options, but I picked out just a few. The first being this tiny tower arborvitae. Um, this would make a fantastic hedge or living fence. You saw those in your plan, Katie, those background plants that sort of really anchor the space. And tiny tower is a wonderful option for that. Um, this is a compact sport off of the popular green giant. So if you're familiar with green giant arborvitae, it gets about 50 feet tall. Tiny tower is gonna be about 20 feet. So it really is better for those modern gardens. Um, and while we don't like to call plants, we are hesitant to say they're absolutely deer resistant. Um, this green giant, as, as many know, is um, known for having good deer resistance. And because Tiny Tower is a sport off of green giant, this will also um, have better resistance to deer as well. So that's always a plus also. And then next to that is green mountain boxwood. This is a naturally upright cone-shaped boxwood. It would make a great candidate for those topiaries that we're talking about, those spirals or the cones, um, a really wonderful accent in a formal garden. And then mint julep is another plant that would be fantastic for those topiaries. You can find them in spirals and poodles and pom-poms, espaliered, all sorts of different um, design choices with this mint julep juniper. And it just is that classic minty green foliage with that beautiful arching form if left um, un untouched. And then uh, Katie, you talked about grasses for this architectural simplicity trend. And I really love switch grasses for that um, just because they're more upright, they're more stately and architectural. Um, Northwind is a relatively, uh, is a newer one. It is uh, really quite sturdy. So even under winter snow loads, those those uh, the stems are gonna stay upright and give you that architectural look. Um, really beautiful olive blue foliage turns golden yellow in the fall, four to six feet tall or so. And then um, a smaller grass-like plant, if you're in a warmer zone, is this Arctic frost uh, lamandra. 
These are really quite versatile, great for tucking between plantings to add contrast and a little bit of texture and color to um, a more formal, more, um, you know, your rounded shrubs. These give a little texture and beautiful variegated foliage on that. And then because it's spring, we're talking early spring blooms and something like emerald blue creeping phlox would be another really attractive flowering ground cover um, for in between those formal plantings, creates sort of a blanket of these gorgeous light blue flowers. Beautiful. I think the other plant that we were talking about that goes here as well as in the Garden of Abundance look is rosemary. And even lavender could, could be really beautiful in... Um you know, in amongst uh, these plants. Um, quick look at our topiary. <laughs> um, I just uh, wanted to um, help people, you know, imagine that there are so many different forms that topiary can take in your garden. Um, and these are just a few, actually, of ones that we grow. Um, so giving a sense of the, the shape and uh, possibility there. Um, so depending on you know, kind of how you want to use the topiary at the at the front of your garden, kind of, you know, bookending um, your entrance or along uh, a pathway or fence or as a statement plant, actually, in the garden. So the other trend that kind of carries forward from what we were talking about with the, the Romans is the Garden of Abundance and this idea of the kitchen garden. Um, the the French and Spanish, you know, uh, Italian certainly, uh, they 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 kept celebrating that idea, and they the French created the the potager garden, um, and so you had this mix of raised beds and boxwoods, you know, in the kitchen garden, um, and what we see now today actually is a similar kind of weaving in of uh, edibles and pollinator plants and herbs with ornamentals. But in this modern design, you can see by Christian Douglas, um, if there's a loosening up a bit of how things grow um, and also uh, not totally relying on growing edibles in uh, raised beds, but instead really planting them in the ground um, and having them at different heights um, to add interest. So several great plants here, Georgia, to, to create this, this feeling of this Garden of Eden, this Garden of Abundance. Yeah, so, you know, classically you'd think edibles, but this also is pollinators, like you mentioned. And one of the best pollinator plants really for the garden is echinacea. It's a wonderful plant filled with pollen and nectar. Kismet raspberry is one of my very favorite new echinaceas to come to market. This is a selection. Um, it was selected for its extra large flowers. I think they're the largest echinacea flowers that I've seen. They're really beautiful. Um, the amount of flowers on this plant is also amazing and just that intense raspberry color paired with that green eye that you can see in the cone um, really quite sturdy stems as well so there's no need to stake and tie so really easy for those pollinators to find those flowers what i really love about kismet um, is that it's one of the top in pollinator visits. So if you're familiar with Mount Cuba Center in Delaware, um, it's a great resource for pollinator friendly plants, native plants, cult, uh, selections of native plants. Um, and they did a large study comparing uh, traditional native type echinaceas with all sorts of different cultivated varieties on the market. And in that study, Kismet Raspberry was one of the top five overall performers for pollinator visits. Um, so this is is a fabulous variety if you're really looking to welcome pollinators to the garden. Is that because of its larger flower? I mean, do you think that helped? I think it really helps. Yeah. Uh -huh. So if you think about what makes the straight echinacea um, really attractive to pollinators, it's the flower and the cone, um, the cone that's filled with all that nectar and pollen. And so when we select um, for larger flowers, larger cones and more of them, it's natural that to, to, to make the um, jump that then pollinators would be able to have more of that for them. Um, yeah, so lots of great stuff um, coming out of a lot of really awesome echinacea on the market now. Um, another great pollinator plant and early spring blooming plant is ajuga. This one here is blueberry muffin, but there are a lot of varieties. I really love blueberry muffin because it has that 
deep green and chocolate brown foliage, um, really nice mildew resistance, and it just covers itself with this deep blue flower. Um, so much bluer, less purple. It's really quite a nice variety. And then uh, edibles also, we talked about those and those do certainly fit here. So strawberries like Seascape would, um, would fit. This is one of the best varieties for both taste and yield. It's really uh, produces a lot of strawberries and it's ever bearing. So it's gonna give you a lot of fruit throughout the spring and throughout the summer. And a nice uh, hedge in your herb garden maybe is Little Ragu, which is the Sweet Bay. It's the edible um, used to flavor soups and sauces and all those delicious Mediterranean dishes. Um, this is a smaller version of a Sweet Bay, so it's going to be about six to eight feet tall and wide. Um, I really love the deep green foliage and the red stems that it has. It just gets this really nice look and it can easily be trimmed to stay smaller than six to eight feet as well. Um, other herbs such as rosemary, uh, Tuscan blue rosemary is perfectly at home in your ornamental beds as well as your herb garden. So it has that lovely blue flower along the stems, great for pollinators. Um, and for ornamental purposes, they start around May where I am, um, and then they continue through the spring and into the summer. Um, of course, the foliage is fragrant and can be used in cooking, a wonderful water-wise garden choice, um, and really great for evergreen screening as well. And then grasses, you might not think of grasses in a garden of abundance, but they really do provide a lot of habitat um, and food for birds. This little blue stem is an Eastern US native plant. Um, it's really critical in providing food, shelter, nesting material, um, all sorts of things for wildlife. And smoke signal is a selection with slightly more upright uh, foliage and this beautiful uh, scarlet purple um, foliage in the fall. Yeah, it's really striking. I feel like there are so many wonderful plants, both new and um, some of our kind of longtime favorites, like um, Little Ragu, Sweet Bay. We've been growing that, you know, here at Monrovia, and we, we discovered it at Monrovia, and um, it's it's been such a, a, a favorite of, um, of our followers. And then I love that Blueberry Muffin <laughs> has the name of an edible but you know it's it's not an edible plant but um but you're right the the striking uh chocolate you know brown foliage and the flowers are just really gorgeous and uh would, would look great back at this in this garden actually you know in the strawberries kind of around a, a water feature that would that would look lovely so let's let's move on to the uh, victorians um who also gave us so much that we're building on today. Uh, you know, uh, during the Victorian era, that's when suddenly, you know, the, the middle class um, suddenly had gardens and um, space that they wanted to cultivate. And this meant the rise of the lawn, or, you know, one of the things that helped the rise of the lawn was, of course, the invention of the lawnmower, which came about in 1830. And then everybody wanted a lawn because it was easier to take care of. Well, what are you going to um, plant around the lawn? Um, and that led to the, the idea of the perennial border, the layering of short plants, you know, in front and taller plants in the back. Uh, but I think more than anything that really changed our, you know, design in the Victorian era was that um, a lot of new plants emerged as um, breeding really took off. And uh, so people had so many choices uh, for color uh, in the garden. And um, they expressed this in these, you know, beautiful um, sort of carpeted um, areas next to the lawn or beautiful beds devoted to stunning flowering shrubs and um, uh, and, and other plants that we associate now with the cottage garden aesthetic, um, and also privacy hedges, you know, planting uh, to block the view, you know, of your neighbor um, sort of be became um, something that one did in garden design then. Um, and obviously, <clears throat> that's still carrying on today. Uh, in the new Victorian garden, what we're seeing is a return uh, first to plants that people you know, might have associated with their grandmother or being around a long time, sort of an re-interest in hydrangeas and roses in lilacs. 
those classic flowers, things that are scented, that are pretty, dainty flowers, you know, are back. Um, but also with a little bit more of a tranquil, more unified palette we're seeing in, in garden design. Um, and a mix of textures, you know, not just flowering plants and perennials, but the use of succulents with some of these flowering shrubs. Um, for instance, in the in the, the Victorian new Victorian garden that's shown down below, you can see how uh, it's, a, it's a really weaving of textures, grasses, succulents with these with a beautiful rose, um, how stunning, how stunning that is. Um, so um, you can also see that we're using it in our landscape design, this sort of new Victorian idea where we still have that layering idea, but we're mixing um, fewer colors and we're mixing succulents with roses, with grasses, uh, maybe even, you know, with a boxwood. Um, and we're sort of playing with the, the pathway idea, you know, from what the, uh, the Romans and Greeks created, these very linear paths, um, now, you know, the, the, the pathways are a little bit more meandering and, and that's going to, you know, come up again in, a, in, a, in the future um, slide here that we're sort of changing the way we're thinking about how we're traveling through our space. So plants. <laughs> yeah, this is a really fun one, in my opinion, because you get to take these beautiful classic plants and with new breeding, sort of give them a new life in the modern garden. Um, so one of the things that uh, new breeding is really working on is um, shrinking down these plants, helping them bloom earlier, bloom longer, have more disease resistance. Um, and little darling is a good example of this. So lilacs are wonderful plants, but they can often get really large and really leggy in the garden. Um, but little darling is very compact. So it's gonna top out at about four feet tall only um, with a beautiful structure. That habit of four feet will let you plant it closer into your spaces your paths, your patios, where you can really enjoy the fantastic fragrance, which everyone loves the lilac for. Um, beautiful plant there. This will bloom twice. You'll get a heavy bloom set in the spring and then another lighter bloom in the summer. So that's another great upgrade to the traditional lilac bush. And then in the middle, uh, shrub roses like Grace and Grit Bicolor are another fabulous update to these finicky, older, disease-prone roses. Um, the Grace and Grit series has beautiful, highly saturated flowers. The bicolor is gorgeous, white, and pink. They're going to self-clean and repeat bloom throughout the season, so you don't have to spend a lot of time deadheading these roses to, um, to get a really nice uh, rose shrub in the garden. You're not going to get those brown, uh, we call them mummies that are going to hang on and, and ruin the look. They're going to self-clean. They also have nice glossy foliage that is resistant to black spots, which we have tested extensively throughout the country. We're really lucky to have four nurseries in all four corners of the country, one of those being South Georgia, which is pretty brutal on roses and uh, especially for black spot and these do beautifully. So we're confident that um, wherever you are, you're gonna have good luck with our Grace and Grit roses. And then next to that is Hydrangeas. Hydrangeas is truly a classic. Seaside Serenade Newport is a fabulous plant, um, not only because of that unique deep purple flower color you get in the acidic soils, um, but because of the cool modern breeding work that has gone into this plant. Um, this is a tetraploid plant, and what that does is it creates really thick stems that help keep the plant tidy and it's not gonna flop over. So no more staking and tying. It's gonna be covered in blooms um, and it's gonna be self-sufficient covered in blooms, which is really nice. Um, it also has nice thick cuticles, both the leaf and the flower are nice and leathery and thick, which means the foliage is less susceptible to tattering and strong winds. Um, and the plant doesn't tend to wilt as bad during those hot summer days. You often get the hydrangea macrophyllas looking a bit sad by the afternoon, but the seaside serenades really do a good job of holding up because it does have so much more robust foliage. Um, the flowers also, because they're quite leathery, hold up um, well and they last a lot longer on the plant. So they're going to last two to three times longer as a cut flower than most garden hydrangeas. They're also going to last up to three months on the plant. 
So you get all of these blooms, they're going to repeat bloom. So you get blooms in the beginning of the season and towards the end, and they last for three months. So really fabulous. I've got a lot to say about Newport. I will cut it off now, but uh, <laughs> really great plant. Um, and then next is a classic early spring flowering for Scythia, um, another plant that can get quite large in the landscape and spring shine stays very compact, about two feet tall. So really easy oh, to really pack. compact, really compact. Yeah. Two to three feet tall. Um, and it flowers all the way up and down the stem. So you get this really beautiful burst of bright yellow color, right? When you need it early spring. Um, classics like rhododendrons can also fit here. So PGM rhododendron is a classic, that distinctive lavender pink flower, beautiful purple bronze winter foliage color. Um, this is one of the hardier rhododendrons, so it can tolerate northern winters, the Midwest, New England a lot better than some of the other rhodes. Um, and at Monrovia, one of the things that really sets our rhododendrons apart is the way that we propagate them. So we use tissue culture. Um, which we have our own tissue culture lab. Um, it's just a way of uh, asexually propagating plants with clean material, uh, material that's really healthy. So you get more uniformity, stronger growth and overall more vigorous plants. Um, and hellebores are also a good example of um, how tissue culture can help with vigor and overall performance of plant material. So Ice and Roses is a new series of hellebore that's out. Um, absolutely gorgeous. There's nothing like this on the market. It has beautiful, large foliage that looks good even when they're not in flower. Um, and the plants themselves produce a lot of flowers and they face more upward. So traditional hellebore, they're from seed. They're often very stringy. The foliage is sort of an afterthought and the flowers hang down. So this is a great um, upgrade to the traditional hellebore. And I feel like hellebores are, again, a plant that's kind of a new discovery for a lot of people. It's sort of coming back in style, coming back in vogue. So it's great to have uh, some updated um, varieties. Uh, the other uh, thing I remember about our rhododendrons is that we pinch, you know, back the buds more often, more frequently um, as we're growing them so that by the time, you know, we're shipping them out to the garden center, it's a really like well branched budded plant for, for your garden. Um, and I'm struck too, Georgia, by some of the things that you mentioned, just how longer blooming a lot of these plants are today versus the plants that might have been in your grandmother's uh, garden. And so, you know, I think that is really exciting and part of that, that look. Um, so the other uh, component of the Victorian garden was this idea of layering, as we said, you know, thinking about edging, whether it's a pathway or um, lawn, um, but, uh, you know, plants that kind of, you know, go well together as a taller one and a, and a shorter flowering idea. So you've put together a few combos. Yeah, so um, we're going top to bottom. So if you see Lilla smoke bush, um, that's paired with this Kirigami columbine. So that's how I'm going to be talking about it. So Lilla is a fabulous uh, new compact version of, you might be familiar with Royal Purple Cotinus, sort of a classic, but it gets rather large, 15 feet tall. Lila is gonna be four feet tall. So much more versatile, much easier to look after year after year and keep it looking really great. Um, and that purple foliage paired with the purple and white flower of this Kirigami columbine, which is a wonderful early spring bloomer, um, might look really nice in the garden. Kirigami is nice because um, they have flowers that face up and they're also about double the size of other columbine flowers. So it makes a really huge impact in the garden. And then in the middle there is cherry laurel. So cherry laurels are wonderful evergreen plants. Great for those finicky part shade areas where you need a little privacy or a little evergreen hedge. Um, Jade Enchantress has improved disease resistance and is much more compact. So it's gonna be um, you know, three to four feet tall um, and be really nice and clean for you. And we've paired that with a new Dianthus that I really, really love. Uh, this is uh, American Pie Berry a la mode much it's a upright type of dianthus with this gorgeous silvery foliage um, the stems are more upright as well and quite strong and they hold just that pure white flower with that magenta center and a, um, a pretty nice fragrance as well 
And then shrubs like dogwood uh, might fit this style of garden. So especially the variegated forms of this red twig dogwood. We've paired it with an early spring flowering twinkle blue platycodon. Um, this is a dwarf selection with these extra large, highly saturated flower. It's going to be just about eight inches tall when it's fully in flower. So it'd be really cute to tuck in um, next to something like this dogwood. Yeah, beautiful. And I think that that Dianthus is another classic Victorian kind of dainty <clears throat> flower with a new a new look, kind of a little bit more um, presence, you know, because it, it's got a bigger a bigger face. And I love that that uh, that pattern on it. It just looks like you brushed, you know, it perfectly. Well, I don't want people to think that we um, are only focused on influences from Europe because, um, you know, we we have definitely seen key principles from um, Japanese design, Chinese, Chinese influencing Japanese, you know, a uh, long, long time ago. Um, but I think some of the principles from ancient Japanese gardens have really um, informed our design here in the U.S. and continue to inform some of the, um, the major design trends that we're seeing today. So I talked about the symmetry that the Greeks and Romans brought um, to us. And I'd say, you know, one of the things that uh, was celebrated in Japanese gardens was um, asymmetry. You know, the beauty of uh, things being a little off center and more naturally angled. Also a reverence for rocks and water um, and a sense of um, a landscape as capturing, being able to capture the fragility of our, of our being, you know, less about putting down kind of a, you know, sturdy foundation and more about celebrating, um, you know, uh, life's fleeting um, moments. And also a, a real reverence for the way that that plants can help us um, meditate um, and feel feel good, and that certain plants have a lot of meaning associated with them, or can, and should be celebrated <clears throat> in our gardens, you know, too. So all of those influences, I think, are continuing to be felt in so many of our gardens today. Um, you know, the the idea of really um, limiting the palette of plants that you're using and thinking about relaxation, creating a mood in the garden, not just a place for walking or entertaining, but, um, but how do you want to maybe slow down uh, the pace a little bit in the garden? And actually <clears throat> in Japanese gardens, wasn't just, oh, you're meant to view the space from one entrance point, but it was more likely that the, the gardens were designed um, so that they could be enjoyed from many moments in the garden and enjoyed differently. And I think um, as we think about how to make best use of our smaller spaces, we're all trying to think about capturing, creating those moments. Um, so these are some examples of some lovely ways uh, to do that with a mix of um, rocks and other materials, and then a mix of um, different kinds of foliage, because I think often in these gardens, it really has been a celebration of, of foliage. And Georgia, you have some, some good um, examples coming up of plants that do that. But this is another uh, plan from our ultimate spring planning guide created by Lisa um, Nunnemaker. She was the designer. And we gave her um, the idea of, you know, we just limited color palette, limited group of plants, what would you, what would you create? And you can see that, you know, she's um, used, um, you know, a mix of grasses and, you know, even hellebore, um, but really left a, a moment for a statement plant in the middle there. And it's just a way to create um, some moment in a shady corner that might otherwise be forgotten. But other plants that might fit this idea, um, and I, I'm just going to say at the outset that I think it, sometimes people associate, you know, yes, the Japanese maple with the style of garden, but they might forget about peonies and the importance of um, shrub peonies or the ito peony, uh, which is a cross between, you know, the best of tree and shrub uh, peonies. Um, so tell us a little bit about, about these plants and, and how they might weave into a, a relaxing space. 
Yeah. So, I mean, we'll just start with, with peonies. Uh -huh. I mean, I'll, I'll switch it up a bit. So that's in the bottom left there. Um, like you mentioned, these are a cross between the herbaceous and the tree peonies. Um, they just are really wonderful. They have create a tiny mound of growth with masses of these extra large, really delicate flowers. This is just an example. Julie, Julia Rose is one, but there are several out there um, that Monrovia grows. They tend to bloom for longer. Um, they also tend to have sturdy stems. So a lot of peonies, I know the ones I inherited in my new garden are the old types where you have to stake and tie and they look really nice and then they flop over. Um, but these ones really don't. So there's not a lot of input that you need. You can just really just enjoy the flowers for the full um, for the full period that they're in bloom. Um, one thing that, that sets Monrovia apart for Ito peonies is the, um, the amount of time that we're growing and the inputs that we use. So if you're familiar with the term, the eyes, so they come in a little, um, in a, in a corm and they have multiple different growing points. And a lot of growers are going to, are going to, um, plant up two to three eyes and sell them that same year that they're planting. So you get these plants that in a couple of years are going to be beautiful in the garden, but you're really getting a, a project, you know, a couple of years you're going to be able to enjoy. Um, but Monrovia, we are selling plants after two to three years. So we're giving, um, we are taking on that, that waiting period for you and you're getting a plant with, you know, eight to 10 eyes or growing points instead. So that's a really, um, I think that gives Monrovia a little bit more value and you can really get that instant satisfaction for the peony. Um, but that's sort of an aside. We'll go back to Velvet Viking <laughs> maple here. This is a fabulous Japanese maple. Um, it's been reliably hardy all the way down to zone four. This was actually found by a landscape designer in Minnesota. Um, the original tree was 15 years old. So really uh, reliably hardy. It makes a beautiful addition to the garden to provide that color and soft texture. Um, it's, a, it's a squat grower, so three feet tall by five feet wide or so, and you can see it beautiful in a container. Um, and then sort of a classic, not a new plant, but a beautiful plant, especially in this sort of um, garden where you're sort of creating moments and feeling at peace. I really like this weeping blue Atlas cedar. Um, it has that sprawling horizontal habit, those icy blue needles. Um, it just creates a very special moment and you can train it into a serpentine form, which we saw on the topiary guide from earlier. Um, but you can also just have it gracefully arch along a fence or structure as shown here. Um, evergreen clematis is one of my personal favorite beacons of spring. Those fragrant white flowers um, really are beautiful. And it's an evergreen vine, which I also love. So you can plant it um, to create privacy or you can plant it over a trellis. Um, we talked about the peonies. Next, also a part of this would be um, a lot of more texture like the ferns. So this is a rather interesting new one from our Dan Hinckley collection. He found this um, while exploring around the, the world, um, this Jurassic Stegosaurus holly. This is an evergreen type of holly, uh, sorry, type of fern. It has these holly-like I see, I, I called it a holly. It's holly-like um, with the fern. <laughs> uh -huh. um, evergreen fronds, really large leaflets. Another one that would look beautiful on sort of a shaded terrace or in a container. And then lastly, uh, another way to think about this is with your indoor plants and um, bringing indoor plants outdoor during the warm parts of the year and sort of swapping them in and out. Um, Ficus umbellata is a fabulous indoor foliage plant, um, extra large heart-shaped foliage on these sort of um, dainty stems, giving this really light, airy um, look to it. Uh, what we are focusing on at Monrovia is larger statement plants. So it's really easy to find, you know, small four inch plants, um, but many of us don't want to wait for those to grow to size or don't have the right environment to facilitate much growth. <laughs> Um, so we're offering larger sizes to create that instant, that instant statement, that instant lush feeling that you can get um, with plants like this ficus umbellata. And I love that it's just, it's kind of different, you know, with the larger leaves and there's something like, oh, you know, I, I think it's sort of familiar, but not, and which I love that about this plant. Um, and it would look great on a covered porch on a, like, as you said, could go, you know, indoors and out, especially where I live 
<clears throat> in California. Um, the other thing that I love about the evergreen um, clematis is that it's it's an early bloomer, right? And it, it keeps, you know, going, going, going. Um, so, you know, it's a great, it's a great um, sort of surprising uh, way to get your garden started, I think, in spring and have it just, you know, continue to provide that lush, beautiful feeling. Um, so, all right, we've covered quite a bit, um, but there are some plants that don't necessarily fit into a trend, <laughs> or they might fit into several, but I was asking Georgia um, about what she thought. What are some plants that are just so interesting that really make you go, wow, what is that? That if you added that, I'm thinking back to the people that shared at the beginning of our hour that they just wanna freshen up you know, some beds and borders. If you just wanted to add one plant this year, what would you add? And of course, um, wasn't hard for Georgia to come up with many, but we've whittled it down to five just for the purposes of time. Do you wanna take us through these? Sure, yeah, so um, I've, I've here are some statement plants I'm really excited about. So the first one is a uh, red bud, uh, great spring flowers as we know, but the flamethrower is a new red bud. It's one of my very favorite new trees to come to market and it's the foliage. The foliage is amazing. No oh, photo yes. does it justice. <laughs> you see it in the garden center, grab it because it's beautiful. Um, it emerges that deep burgundy red. And then as it ages, it moves through these shades of amber and bright yellow. And then as it gets into the trunk, it goes green. And so you get this multi-tone color display, which is pretty persistent throughout the entire season. So you always have this beautiful, almost four or five different colors on a single branch at a time. It's really quite stunning. Um, this is a smaller tree, so 15, 20 feet tall and wide. Um, in full sun, it's also done really well uh, without leaf scorch, which is something that can be a, a trouble with, with red buds. So this is really um, a great, not only for its garden performance, but also for its ornamental value. And then uh, next is another seaside serenade. This is Glacier Bay. It's one of our newest to come to the market. We are trialing hundreds of hydrangeas all the time and we pass on 99.9% .9 of them. And we only introduce now ones that we think are really special. And this Glacier Bay is super, super special. It is um, quite modern, which is hydrangea macrophyllas are sort of that classic shrub, but this is not a classic one. This is so modern. It has jet black stems, this crisp, clean, white lace cap flower, almost cupped and star-shaped. It's really interesting, um, wonderful, bushy, sturdy habit again, so no staking, no tying, um, and it's going to bloom on both old and new wood. And it also makes striking cut flowers. I mean, honestly, in a vase, it's just really eye-catching, really beautiful. Yeah, we've shown this at a couple of places and um, the amount of attention that this plant gets. Mm -hmm. um, and, and honestly surprised sometimes that it's a hydrangea when we yeah. tell people. Yeah. Um, it's just really fabulous and there's nothing like it on the market. Um, next is a bougainvillea called Burgundy Queen. This is cool because we actually, we found it at our, uh, at our Cairo, Georgia nursery. One of our craftsmen uh, spotted it growing and he spotted that beautiful burgundy foliage. So most bougainvilleas are all about the beautiful flowers, but this is about not only the flowers, but the foliage, which adds this really dramatic um, cast to the whole plant. Um, super easy to grow, great drought tolerant vine as well. And then on the bottom here is Bridal Veil Agapanthus. Uh, there's a lot of compact Agapanthus on the market, but there's not a great white, true compact Agapanthus. And this is so wonderful. We selected it at our organ nursery. We found it um, as a one-off plant and have been building and building and building. Um, really excited to finally be able to bring it to market. It is um, quite short, only about, I would say, maybe 12 to 24 inches tall um, and just covers itself in these pure white flowers. Um, oftentimes with white agapanthus and compact agapanthus, they're not the best growers, so they can be sort of wimpy in the garden. 
Um, but this really is quite vigorous um, and quite and robust. It's really covered with blooms. I mean, that's the other thing that's different about uh, this compact agapanthus. Mm -hmm. Usually one that tiny doesn't have quite so big of a yeah. display. <laughs> and it makes it a really wonderful plant to have at the, you know, the edge of a bed also because of its, um, yeah, its height. And it's, it, you know, pollinator, hummingbird friendly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, pollinators will like the agapanthus. And, you know, we're talking about freshing up beds and just adding a couple plants here and there. This would be a fabulous one to, to do. Um, and then lastly is another indoor plant. This is Thai constellation monstera. So this is a super cool variegated house plant, huge leaves, um, green with splashings of white. Um, this has been hard to find for a long time, but we're really excited that we're going to have um, plants to sell this spring. So you should be able to see it in a Monrovia container um, as part of our line, focusing on those larger container sizes, that instant satisfaction. So we're not going to be growing this in a four inch container, we're going to be growing it in a, in a one to, and two gallon plant. So really excited to be able to bring um, something sort of special to the houseplant market. Yeah. And we're seeing a lot more variegation uh, on houseplants and, and color variation too um, emerging. That's a really interesting trend. Um, there's a lot going on in indoor plants as well, but that's for another webinar. <laughs> <laughs> That concludes um, our session on timeless designs and uh, the must-have plants to um, fulfill them. Um, but Kathleen, I think we have a few minutes. If yeah, the, we do. And we, we've had great participation today. Lots of really wonderful questions. Let's start out with the one that we, we get every time we do a webinar. Everyone wants to know what the pictures or what the varieties are behind us in our pictures. And I'll start. I, Little Darling Lilac is behind me today. And um, I have Lady Pterodactyl uh, Jurassic Fern. It's part of our Jurassic Fern series. This is a Dan Hinckley uh, fern. I just, I'm crazy about the texture. Um, I'm all about texture in my garden. So that's why I picked this one. And mine is our nitty gritty peach rose. Um, part of our, I talked about roses earlier with our grace and grit. Nitty gritty is um, a fabulous ground cover type rose uh, series that we have and peach is just beautiful. I just love that color. I have that one in my, my garden. It is stunning, absolutely stunning. So Katie, question for you, the layouts that you were sharing from Lisa Nunnemaker, where can people get them? There was lots of questions about that. Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so they are all going to be in a collection that we are releasing next week. And if you are a subscriber to our newsletter, our Grow Beautifully newsletter, you'll receive a link to download the guide yourself. And so you just download it on a desktop um, and you'll have 10 plans. So in addition to the ones that I showed, there are seven more. Um, and they range in size from the outdoor room that I showed that's a little bit more ambitious to the smaller shady corner idea. And we've got um, a retaining wall. Uh, we've got, you know, a great driveway border idea. So um, look for that next week in your inbox if you are an email subscriber. And if you're not already signed up, I encourage you to do so. Sounds good. We have, like I said, had many, many questions today, and we're still answering a few of them. So we'll go through and, and make sure that everybody gets their questions answered. And that really is all we have time for today. You'll re you will receive a link for today's webinar in your email, and that email will also include a plant list with direct links for more information on all the great varieties that were talked about today. So be sure and visit monrovia.com so you can get information on all the new webinars coming up as well. Yeah, I was going to just mention that, that um, as spring is uh, coming, um, monrovia.com can be a great resource. So look for My Plant Finder and you can enter your zone and whatever you're looking for in terms of your landscape need, you can search our plants that way. Um, and the other thing I would suggest you check out is the Be Inspired blog. A lot of the design ideas and stories um, that I reference here, you can find them in more detail on the Be Inspired blog. So uh, lots to check out um, as a resource on monrovia.com. 
Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Georgia. Great inspiration as always. Appreciate it. All right. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Have a good day. Happy spring.